Yeah, uh-oh, it's right. So what's going to happen is, is uh, I want to just go through a couple things here during this section. Then we're going to break into two rooms. And one room is people who've been working on CCL for a while. You've been coming to meetings. Maybe you've been to a group start, group start workshop. And then the other group, which is the group that I'll be with, are the people who you're pretty much new to citizens climate lobbying, giving, filling in some of the background, some of the orientation would probably be helpful. So just in terms of how many people seem you're probably pretty new, you should be coming with me for that session. Okay, and how many of you are pretty experienced? You'd be in the other category. Okay. All right. <laughs> you, <laughs> the amazing Madeline Para, who's in charge of all of CCL's groups being successful. Very small accountability that she handles really nicely. Um, so uh, I spent the last 30 years working in the arena of uh, effectiveness, human performance, uh, both in corporate uh, situations and with, with uh, people. The last thing I was doing before I actually came to CCL staff was working for an organization called Mission Control. And uh, my largest clients were Boeing and NASA, uh, top level scientists and engineers. One of my all time favorite workshops was talking to 30 of the top people at NASA and saying, Good morning, I'm the one here that's actually from Mission Control. Um, that made me particularly happy. Um, but, so we would um, measure a lot of things before we would go work with people, and then we would measure things down the road to see if there was a lasting impact. And what we found was, this was, a, just so you know, a great business to be in. I mean, we'd get between thirty dollars to $50,000 for a day and a half workshop. You know, those kind of companies could pay it. And then we'd measure a bunch of stuff, and we'd find out that there was somewhere between a five and an eight time return and financially to the company in terms of improved performance down the road. And what we found to, to actually work in a way that was useful, we had to work on three levels. One is we did have to give people new tools. So we'd have to say, you used to do this, don't do that anymore, do this. And that was useful to people. But for to give people a new tool and to think that they were actually going to incorporate it and that they were going to continue to use it over time, you also had to address work habits. Because anybody who's worked in the arena of, of habits, changing behavior, no, it usually takes reinforcing something or doing it at least 30 times to develop a new habit, a new behavior, right? Yeah. So we would work on tools and we would work on work habits. But those were both insignificant in the face of the third area that we would work on. And the third area, which was really the only thing that mattered, was the context or the background or the environment in which people worked. And the fact of the matter is, for most people going to work, the way they have to approach work is in a really non-productive way. So if you just look at the way people describe work, not the things anybody says out loud, but what everybody knows before anybody walks to the office, is work sucks. <laughs> you know, that's why there's terms like hump Wednesday and, you know, happy hour where we're going to get over this terrible thing of work. In the uh, late 70s, early 80s, there was a book called, written called Megatrends. Some of you might have heard of it. Well, one of the things the authors observed in Megatrends, and this is way back, you know, 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago. At that point, they said people were spending 80% um, of their life being at work. Now, how they measured that is they said, not just the time at work, but going to work, coming home from work, bringing work home, thinking about work, dreaming about work, having nightmares about work. <laughs> so people were spending the majority of their life being at work, but they expected to only get between 15 and 20% of the benefit they got, of the value of what was important in their life from the time at work. So essentially what people were setting themselves up for was a world where they were going to spend the majority of their life on something that they didn't get anything except for money back for. Okay, does that make sense so far? Okay, so all we did was is begin to do two things. One is to identify that people had background assumptions about work that were debilitating. And that if people could replace that by being at work was meaningful, it was valuable. I didn't just get a paycheck, but my life became better from it. Do you think people perform better at work? Yes. Yeah, and in fact they did. And then we would also identify what was the culture of that organization. So if you work with a, with a scientists and, 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 and uh, top engineers at NASA, they're working on these really interesting things. It's like a combination of NASA and JPL two years ago landed something the size of an SUV on Mars. Yeah. Now, I don't think that's very simple. <laughs> I, I think that requires an extraordinary kind of work. But in the back of their mind, in the back of their mind, what they always knew is 
one member of Congress could stick their finger in the middle of the project and it would fall apart. So there was this certain kind of cynicism about what they were doing of, we're going to get screwed on this deal. So we would identify, first of all, just the basic background about work, and then the particular one for that particular organization, and we would find really remarkable things would happen. Let me give you an example of something we might have worked on if we worked in healthcare. Gene Johnson, uh, hospital administrator. Uh, one of the things, one of the biggest problems in American hospitals is we kill about 186,000 Americans every year by making mistakes. So we, we, we give people the wrong dosage or the wrong medication, we have the wrong person work with them. About 186,000 people die unnecessarily because of medical errors. So if you work with hospitals, one of the things that they will all tell you they're doing is working on reducing the number of medical errors that are happening. And so they put these programs in place and most of the hospitals do in fact reduce the number of mistakes that are happening. Now interestingly enough, none of the hospitals I've ever talked to said they're working on eliminating <laughs> medical errors. So if what you're working on is reducing, you'll probably reduce, won't you? And if you're working on eliminating, you might see a different world than if you're just reducing, right? Okay, so we have made a couple attempts in this organization to change the context in which people deal with this issue. So if you've been to a group start workshop, you'll remember one of the things that we make a case for is, is that we're an organization that works in relationship to what it's for as contrasted to what it's against. You've probably heard people say that here. You know, anybody knows who they don't like, what they disagree with, what they don't want. The harder question is, what are you in favor of? So the first thing we did was, is we said we're going to be an organization that's working in relationship to what it's for as contrasted to what it's against. That was an attempt to shift the background in which people worked with other people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so then we took a second cut at it. And the second cut was this is we said the basis of our meetings with members of Congress was going to be admiration, respect, and gratitude for their public service. Now that was also an attempt to provide a new context for working with people. Because the most kind of default context that most people have is agree or disagree. And so if you disagree with people, what do you do to get them to agree with you? You convince them, right? And how much do you love having people convince you that you should think differently than you do? Don't you just love that? Wow, thank you for straightening me out. I, I've been so confused for so long and I'm so happy that finally you convinced me that I've always thought about all these things incorrectly. So we said, okay, let's see if we can slide that context to the side and frame one on that says if we start with admiration, respect, and gratitude for people's public service, what will happen? Right? Okay. So that's part of what we want to work on today and then a lot also tomorrow morning. Um, we also want to walk on, I don't know, how many of you were there last night? Here last night. Okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. Okay. So one of the things I said is, is we we're going to work on listening, but not the part of only hearing what people say, but what's in the background. So, for instance, last weekend in Atlanta, Bob Inglis was at our conference. Bob Inglis, conservative Republican from South Carolina, enters the carbon tax bill in 2009. He said, when you say sustainable, Republicans hear bug eaters. What's bug eaters? People who eat bugs. That's what bug eaters are. People who eat bugs. So, and I think... To a large degree, you and I are unconscious about that. We're not aware of the background into which we're speaking. So we think everybody understands things exactly the way we do, therefore the way we explain it should make sense. You know, I think everybody here understands just having the information has not been sufficient to deal with this issue, right? I mean, listen. Everybody in this country has had all the information on diet and exercise for forever. And it hasn't sunk in yet, has it? Not to the degree that it should. So we need to be aware of other things than just making sure that the right information is there. 
So we, we want to work on what's in the background, and we just wanted to make a quick exercise to see if we can work on what you and I are working on here. So, and that's particularly, in a certain sense, what is the context in which we're working over today and tomorrow? Um, I'm going to ask you to do an exercise in just a moment. And in the exercise, I'm going to ask you to pair up, or there might have to be three of you, uh, just because we're not going to take the time to make sure there's two people for everybody. We would spend the next half hour doing that. Okay, now we got everybody, but we're done. Um, <laughs> and the, the question's going to be, what, are, what is it that we're, we're going to accomplish here? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by the term accomplishment, then I'm going to give you a chance to answer the question. My friend Amy, who works with me, who was the first person I hired at Citizens Climate Lobby, likes to tell the story of one guy's dog. Oh, I just screwed your thing up, didn't I? I'm following you. Okay, all right, you're okay? All right. So, um, she likes to tell the story of the guy's walking down the road one day, and he sees the guy, and the guy's chipping away the stone, and she says, what are you doing? The guy says, I'm chipping stone. So he keeps walking, walks another mile, sees another person doing the same thing, same hammer, same rock, chipping away, says, what are you doing? And the next guy says, I'm building a cathedral. <laughs> exact same activity, different context, different background, right? So what I want to do is ask you to answer the question, what are we accomplishing here? And in a certain sense, what you're doing is putting yourself in the future, maybe perhaps the cathedral being built, and saying, what are we accomplishing? But I want to add one more piece before you answer the question. So how many of you have heard the name Martin Heidegger before? Martin Heidegger, OK, German existential philosopher. Can, uh, can I spell Heidegger? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can, because it's right in front of me. H-E-I-D-E-G-G-E-R. This is from his letter on humanism. Um, I can read Martin Heidegger in doses, doses that are about this long, otherwise each paragraph I have to sleep for days in between. <laughs> it's so dense. Here's what Heidegger says about when he's talking about accomplishments versus results. So we're not just talking about what we're going to do. We're talking about what are we going to accomplish, what are we going to achieve, etc. Heidegger says we're still far from pondering the essence of action decisively enough. We view action only as causing an effect. The actuality of the effect is valued according to its utility. But the essence of action is accomplishment. To accomplish means to unfold something into the fullness of its essence, to lead it forth into this fullness, produce a ray, the Latin word. He says, therefore, only what is can really be accomplished. So he says, to accomplish means to unfold something into the fullness of its essence, to lead it forth into this fullness, Therefore, only what already is can be accomplished. So I'm going to ask you to pair up in a moment and say something in the past tense. And the past tense is, maybe you're saying, I have, a, as a climate activist, have become this person. Or maybe my chapter has become this. Or CCL has become this. Or maybe the movement of dealing with this issue itself. So there's a big difference then. We're just going to do some things, learn some laser talks, get some additional training, then to actually say, we will have become different people, a different organization from our working together. Perhaps, maybe, we can't guarantee it, but maybe working inside of a different context for our work over the next day and a half changes what we can actually see. Does that make sense? OK. I'll give you one more example, then we'll do the exercise. So um, when they were first beginning to um, think about germ theory, um, you couldn't see germs. So given you couldn't see them, physicians in general didn't believe that they were there. So if you were sick and you went to the physician, they would drill, drill a hole in your head, and they would let out some of the humors, because clearly you had what? An imbalance of humors. Everybody knows that, right? And sometimes when you drill people's head, they get better. And so that just obviously reaffirms that what we're doing works, right? So along comes a guy named Samwise. And Samwise says, no, that's not the case. There is something called germs, and germs are killing people. And the, they had a huge problem at that time in Europe that a lot of women didn't su survive childbirth. And Dr. Samwise's theory was because the same physicians who worked with birthing mothers worked with uh, uh, cadavers, they were spreading germs. So he said, I'm going to do a controlled experiment. My physicians will wash their hands. More women will survive childbirth. His physicians did wash their hands. More of the women survived childbirth. He goes to the medical schools in Europe and they say, what? Oh, great. You invented this new thing? No. 
No, what did they say? You're crazy. You're crazy. We can't see germs. You don't know what you're talking about. We're going to keep drilling people's heads. So what happened is that they didn't have the context or the framework to even hear what he was saying. Right? So we want to see, let's just do a little experiment here and see if, if, if just identifying the context for our work over the next day and a half matters. Does it perhaps allow us to see things we wouldn't ordinarily see? So again, what you're going to do is you're going to pair up and you're going to answer the question, and it's in the past tense. I have become this kind of person. We have, as a CCL chapter, or CCL as an organization, or it could be the entire movement for dealing with climate change. Now listen, nobody ever asks you to answer questions like this, so you're probably like, oh my god, what am I going to say? You'll figure it out. Don't worry about it, okay? So pair up with someone close to you and whoever has the sexiest eyes, you go first. Okay, so, so in this arena, in this arena, where you're looking at what is, uh, what is maybe the most powerful context for you to deal with something, um, it's one of the things that we want to talk about tomorrow is, is what is a possible context that gives us the best possible way forward. I certainly think one of the things that a lot of people in CCL have identified themselves here now is they've made a shift from talking about the problem to solving it. I think that's a game change in terms of how people work on the issue is, I'm not talking about it, I'm solving it. Now, I don't know exactly how we get there, but I'm working on the solution, not complaining about why it's not happening. So that's been really interesting. And you know, for those of you who've been around more than a year or a couple of years, you've seen that all of the innovation that's happened in this organization is because somebody in the field has thought outside the box and said, we're going to do this. And everybody's mind get blown. So what's interesting about the exercise we just did is when you said, I have become, we have become, etc., whether you got it right isn't a matter of accuracy. It's a matter of, did you say something where the back of the hair kind of stood up on your neck and said, holy cow, that would be amazing. Okay, it's a whole different rules of what we're working on. It's not, is the door really over there? That's one way of, of talking about things, right? Yeah, the door's there, isn't it? We would, like, nine out of 10 people would agree the door's over there. <laughs> For the one out of 10, we're a little worried about you. <laughs> but in CCL, we love everybody, so you're still part of it. Yeah, and, yeah well, there's a door over there, too, so yeah. <laughs> so it's not just the door. See, we have a few people that quibble. That's fine. Um, so the question I have is, when you were talking to someone, did anybody you were talking to, did the hair kind of raise on your neck when they said something, and so should we ask them to share that with the whole group? So does anybody have somebody who was next? you say something and you're like, wow, it would be cool if everybody heard that. It's not always the case, but sometimes somebody said something. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, Jordan uh, declared that he had become a conscious steward of the earth. Yeah. And Chuck asked him what that looked like, and he, he talked about it. Mm -hmm. And it was inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Good, good, good. Anybody else? Yeah? Uh, Tom, Tom shared that when you're looking at the earth and people and like jobs and all the work, the earth is primary. Mm. And that people and jobs are a derivative of the earth, so that in all decisions, the earth needs to be considered in what we do. Great. Nice. Nice. Anybody else? Yeah. A kid? Yes. Great, great. Well, I mean, those, those dates are up here, just so you know, June 22nd through 24th, the International Conference, Washington, D.C. Uh, that is one of those events that will kind of naturally change the context you work in, uh, because you can't, it's, it's just hard to get over it. Uh, it's not for everybody. Some people would be better for them to stay home and be crabby and angry. <laughs> you know, I'm still mad and nothing's ever going to work. Arr. But, you know, and it's not for everybody because it's, it's, it costs something to get there. And DC's an expensive place, so it's not for everybody. But if you could make it, uh, just prepare to become, walk out of the other side of that different person also.